There you are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Talk King podcast. I'm your host, Nick Wendell, and I'm joined today by the other guy. Tom uh, Wendell, also known <laughs> as the other guy. AKA the other guy, AKA that one. <laughs> AKA <enough>. hey you. <laughs> when they say they, they mean him. Yeah. <laughs> it's what they said. Yeah, exactly. So? Tom, uh, we just got off of about an hour Zoom call with our family, and uh, yeah. and after that, how are you feeling about your career choice? You know, honestly, like we're all human. I just mm -hmm. like I slipped up. I you know, listen, just because I study English doesn't mean I have to be a hundred percent all the time. Yeah, I mean, like like uh, like I said, Tom, at least you could read when you were seven so i can i did i read when i was seven the scholastic yeah. book fair yeah a1 this is the first time ever that i had gotten more praise in a school conversation than you in my entire academic career yeah well i don't know i mean, I, I my brain is just mush right now i'm I've, sure i'm sure it's midterms I'm sure that you're still doing way better than me on grades, but sh we don't need to tell them that. As long as 3.5 cumulative GPA. As long as I get pencils. I'm yeah, as long as you keep getting keys. Apparently, that's how you win their heart. It's more important than actual grade point averages. Yeah, exactly. Anybody. Yeah. Actually, the key. Major key alert. DJ Cal just dropped some keys on you. There you go. So, first topic. Bombings. How do you feel about them? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, well, you know, I really thought that we'd get our stimulus check before we dropped a bomb on someone, but uh, I guess how do, you think we, how do you think we afforded those bombs? Uh, our stimulus money. Stimulus. That's STEMI. Went the STEMI. Straight. Went Daddy straight. Joe didn't give us our STEMI. Big Joe didn't give us the STEMI, but he definitely lit up Syria. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not surprised. Oh, no. But Gas and oil, hike up. Exactly. Even though prices are going up for other reasons, but... What are those other reasons? There was... So, it was either in 2019, uh, at like towards the end or last year, um, Russia and Saudi Arabia got into a price war over gasoline, um, which caused a real big... Uh, drop in the price of a barrel of oil. Um, that war, that price war has since been uh, resolved and so prices are going back up. Um, there you go. There's, I mean, that's just my understanding of it. Um, plus it's also winter. Isn't uh, gas more expensive in winter anyways? Because they have to yeah. put like chemicals in it. Yeah, so it stays, it doesn't like freeze or anything. Yeah. All right. Good topic. Bombs and gas. People are going to be really interested in this podcast. Yeah, I mean, we can literally get into I have there is no subject matter that we can or can't talk about. We're uh, just two idiots who are talking. Just two dudes talking. I mean, Talk king. That's the play. That's why That's I called that. Um, that air really good. Fantastic. Um, this is. A, I need to take this stuff off. Yeah. Oh my god. No, let's get. Let's get. Do you have anything important doing? You're doing right now, or? Do I have anything important to what? Are you doing anything important right now? Like, do you need to go do something? Um, I was writing about. I was legitimately writing about communism in uh, vampires, and the pedagogical me, tools. Why don't you tell me a little bit about communism and vampires? Yeah, so um, if you're not familiar, Karl Marx, the father of communism, as a lot of people will call it, um, uses vampires a lot, the imagery of vampires in his discussion of capitalism. Um, and so when uh, teaching uh, the works of Karl Marx or other philosophers, especially Marx, though, because he mentions it, you can use uh, the vampire imagery, especially because of the recent... Um, 
the recent like resurgence of vampires in pop culture with like True Bloods, Twilight, um, etc. And so t- when you're talking about like class conflicts, um, alienation from self, and the idea of class complacency. By um, class absolutely... conflicts, do you mean like middle class, lower class, upper class? Like a, like a bourgeois bourgeoisie, so like a working class to an upper middle, upper class. I see. Um, I, it's really interesting if you're into that kind of stuff like I am. Um, I guess. I mean, I have to, the presentation's on Thursday, but I was, I just finished writing my midterm for that class as well the other day. Um, it was about masochism in Dracula specifically. Um, so, I mean, you know, very exciting stuff, very yeah. exciting subject matter. So are you, so you still have one more semester left? I have, so I have, um, I have like this semester is on campus doing learning and whatnot. Next semester I will be student teaching at a place that I still don't know. That's a good place. I've heard a lot of, a lot of, a lot of great things about that. Place. Um, everyone else is getting their placements and I'm not. So I have a feeling either something went horribly wrong with mine or, um, Mine is just less because, you know, we're Windows Windle. W. Yeah. There's a high chance that it is just the Windle, um, you know, last name. Yeah, um, I mean, I saw someone with the last name of Q get it. Um, so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, uh, you know, I obviously uh, know you, but since this is the first episode, I'm going to give... A little bit of background on you. Okay. Uh, what I can. Um, I'm talking with Tom Wendell today. Again. That's Again. Me. I would like to double <laughs> introduce my guest. Um, triple it. Triple. Okay. You know, back again, back at it with Tom Wendell. It's your boy. <laughs> it's your boy. Um, he is a English major with a, are you still doing history minor? Yes. With a history minor, he goes to ISU, well, that is Illinois State University in yeah. Illinois. Go Redbirds. Yeah. Go Birds. Back the birds, baby. I, re- I wore your hat. I think either Did you, you or dad got me. The, uh, it was you that got me that. that There's like, the Operation Hometown hat, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought I got you that. Yeah. I'll get you a Michigan hat at some point. When I Thanks. See you. That shirt you got me doesn't fit me anymore, so... Get you another one. I'll send something your way. Um, yeah, so, you know. Are you nervous? Is this, because this is going to, I'm going to post on, I, I mean. This I isn't, guess. no, this isn't my first podcast, actually. Really? You've been on no. a podcast? Yeah, um, so my roommate, uh, a friend from home and I, whenever we're all here together, um, we have, re- we recently uh, started a podcast. I forget what it was called, but it's just, you know, another podcast where we're kind of talking about stuff and things. Um, but that not, one's... not what I talk about, which this is a place exclusively to talk about stuff, but more importantly, things, right? Yeah, no, that podcast is things and more importantly, stuff, whereas this one is stuff and more importantly, things. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I didn't so want, oh, you know, I didn't want my future audience to be confused with. No, I podcast. honestly, I don't think we actually came up with a name for that other podcast yet. This one is much more developed um, because have we have whole, our title. I have a whole Instagram page and that's it. A whole so. Insta page. Follow us. Talking. Yeah. Talking. On the Insta. I think that's the only social media we're on right now. Yeah. I want to figure out how to start a Spotify. Just start a YouTube thing remember when we tried to start a youtube when we were oh yeah green shark, <laughs> green shark gaming. gaming yeah uh where yeah. i was going to make xbox controllers and put out great online sensational video game hits yep and we couldn't do it because i didn't know how to change the name <laughs> and there there it was and that was the end of a great our youtube time. our youtube careers were dashed maybe, maybe i'll start like a Maybe I'll do a, like a YouTube's clips, like a like clips a best clip. of podcast thing. Yeah, like a 
Yeah, because I plan on doing these, depends on, because I'll probably do some solo if it's like, a, if I feel, you know, like I have. Like a, like a, about. like a, like a video journal type thing? Yeah, like, yeah, kind of like that. And then um, I definitely want to make some with, you know, my friends and even like people like, like my professors, I was thinking, you know, just mm -hmm. to, like some more professional, like ask yeah. them about, you know, their jobs. Cause I mean, I would personally just like to know that stuff anyways, just like how they got along in the yeah. you know, professional world. And we'll do a, a podcast crossover with uh, Joe Rogan. Yeah. Me and Joe actually go way back to when yeah. I was uh, actually, a, I was in space with mm -hmm. Elon, and yeah. Joe and I had a conversation with Mars yeah so yeah i was too busy in atlantis talking with uh james cameron yeah i mean um, we all have our things in his new his new pick about atlantis coming out 2025 mm -hmm. um i i'm not allowed to tell any more than that mm. um this is definitely real authentic information yeah that has no satirical or fake uh, anything whatsoever. Us, us being satirical? Who would have thought? Not not in a million thought? years. Certainly not me. I couldn't couldn't be me, honestly. If you it couldn't be me. I honestly couldn't. You know, it's just it's a lot. So, you know, I think that you you have introduced me, so I think that you should introduce yourself, or would you like me to introduce you? If you could introduce me in the way a WWE wrestler gets introduced to a <laughs> Royal Rumble. Um, well, good God! <laughs> good God, it's Nick Wendell. <laughs> from, the, from the top ropes. From the top ropes. <laughs> He's got the chair. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is that? Wait a minute. Burn it, burn it, burn it. <laughs> What would your what would your WWE walk-in song? Be? My walkout song. What's the walkout song? Um. There's there's a lot to pick from. You know, you could do like Claire de Lune, um, Mozart, or as either Mozart or Beethoven's uh, orchestral piece. Very very dainty, but also you know very professional. It come out to a lo-fi beat. What it means business? <laughs> yeah. Come <laughs> Yo, I'm going to set the yeah, vibes. My, my buzz lo-fi. <laughs> you should listen. <laughs> Just come, come out. It's so chill. People can't even fight me because of how relaxed they are. <laughs> you got candles in each hand. Just lavender running down us with essential oils. <laughs> Just like some cheap lo-fi cover of like driver's license. Yeah. <laughs> No, I drive alone down the street. Yeah. Yeah, so, but if I had to, now since we're on the subject of walkout songs, I think either Seven Nation Army, you know. Okay, classic. It's kind of, classic. It's kind of a vibe, like, dun, dun, it's kind of like eerie, maybe like a little like reverb on it. So it's like a, it's like a, you know, more you know, eerie, like a little creepy, maybe a little fog coming out. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Or, complete opposite, it's Friday. The Rebecca oh, Black yes. song. <laughs> they couldn't, if I walked out to a two minute, it's Friday, they would want to quit before I even But got what if it's not Friday? I, I signed to Monday what Night Raw. What if it's Raw. a Tuesday? I signed to Monday Night Raw, and I play it's Friday. It's, just throw thousands of people off. Yeah, Wait, it's Friday? I thought it was Tuesday. Everybody, everybody, nobody knows what's going on. Yeah, exactly. You can, you can, you got the element of surprise. Yeah. Then you can drop them. It's my trap card. Exactly. What would be your walkout song? You know, I, I mentioned it and then refused to think about it for myself. Um, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Beethoven's Fifth, yeah. Definitely that. Classic. Um, that's right up there with uh, Canon and D, um, there it is. or funeral, or the funeral march, just straight. <laughs> there it is. Um, I don't, I don't. Probably um, either here comes the boom, 
um, by like pod or POD or whatever they, whatever they were, or like a Dropkick Murphy song, yeah. just because it has the name Hitting Dropkick. <laughs> yeah, definitely a uh, state of Massachusetts, even <laughs> though you know I'm a pasty white kid from Illinois. Yeah. Um, I still, we still, I still haven't announced who I am. But see, the thing is, like, yeah, we definitely, that, I definitely said introduce yourself and then brought up the topic of uh, walkout songs. Who you of a walkout? Song. So, yep, here it's so weird introducing yourself. Like, I can't even so you name it. your major and one thing about yourself. Yeah, and one thing you like to do for fun. fun yeah. So. My name is Nick Wendell. Yeah. Also known as Nick Wendell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm currently a junior at Northern Michigan University for construction management. And uh, I'm going to the league, baby. Going to the league. I don't know what league. I'm just going to the league. Going to Rocket League. <laughs> going, going to Rocket League. Heck yeah. There it is. There, uh, here, here's me. Here. Yep. Yeah. For for an intro an, an, an introductory episode of a podcast, this is going. Yeah, this is going. See, the thing is, I know that nobody's gonna listen to this. Or yeah. If they do listen to this, they know me. Well, yeah, because either they're gonna know you, um, or when when you hit it big, um, they're gonna come back to like where we started, you know. Yeah. And they'll see this and be like, "What the hell?" Yeah, those guys. They were really humble. They were like humble really, and very confusing beginnings. Yeah, very. Uh, nothing's great in the beginning, you know. I think the fact that I have a mic and that I'm recording something is a good start to a thing, you know. Yeah, you gotta start somewhere. Gotta start at some point. You gotta start and somewhere. And the thing that like made me do this was that like I was talking to a buddy about you know when I first got to college about like you know just starting a podcast and all that. And then that same kid came up to me again. He's still like my friend, but he came up to me and he's like, yeah, you've always like, you know, cause I started like, I, he brought up that and I was like, did you ever start it? I was like, no, but like, he's like, you, you know, you, you do like to talk. And like, when we talk, it's like a good time and you know, you're insightful and all that. And like, you, you know, it's not like just nonsensical conversation, which it, there's nothing bad with it, like a funny conversation over here and there, but it's like, you know, just having like kids our age really don't have like good conversations, you know, or at least mm-hmm. uh, most of the time, like even like small talk is real weird, but it's yeah. like, it's hard to sit down, you know, for a while and just like, cause even these like, not like, I know like we talked about like Joe Rogan and all that stuff, but I've been like, I've watched like three or four different podcasts and like, you know, all of them are like pretty much like around an hour long, you know, Joe's are usually like two hours, two, three hours, but like even just like sitting down and talking for like a good like half hour, 45 minutes and just like, you like just talking, like, I feel like I said like too many times. I feel when fail you. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that it's better because, you know, I know you mm-hmm. we grew up together basically for anybody. Yeah that doesn't know Tom and I are cousins with the yeah. last name of Wendell and we grew up being best friends. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's like, where, I, whereas I have to get something more structured with, if I was with somebody who I wasn't really, you know, I didn't know that well, but like you and I can just like bounce off each other and we both. Yeah. We just, this is like a, an hour long jam sesh of talking. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I, as it is, nice in a way like I don't listen to podcasts regularly um but it is nice to just hear people talk like it's it, people honestly have really interesting things to say mm-hmm. um and I think that podcasts are a way to release that energy and to release those comments um and you know I think that there's there's power in that so yeah it's just it's it's different than because I've never like been super into like texting or anything 
like that. So it's like when I want to hang out with you, and let's say we're both home, I literally call you and say, hey, I'm going to be over in like 10 yes, minutes. Yes, you do. And, I and I'm like, well, time to put pants on. Yeah, because like I don't, like I'd rather, you know, when we were like, you know, like 14, 15, like playing video games, like you and I play Minecraft at like 3 a.m., but now like I want to go do stuff, you know? Yeah. I want to go do stuff. I want to talk. I, I still like, play Minecraft at 3 a.m. on the side, but. I play, I play, I just got back into Minecraft a lot, actually. Um, I just got out of a uh, Skyrim phase. I was just in, I just played Skyrim for like a solid week there. Really? Did you like make a new character? You had an old one. Oh, you got to make a new character every yeah. time. Yeah. And you're, you're always, you know, like whenever you start a new Skyrim character, you're like, oh, I'll do this. And then you just end up like two-handed heavy armor. Yeah. <laughs> it's never like oh yeah i'm gonna make it this fun intricate thing and you're like oh but you mean the same character as last time but you mean if i can wear the mask of clavicus vile <laughs> yeah every time i will i did i ever t- or show you when i modded that thing where i got every item on skyrim on xbox when i no, had- you didn't it was literally i had every single item and you start off spawn so there's this thing called a skeleton key and it opens every you it's always reusable but it opens lit, it, everything in the game it opens so there's stuff like like boss level stuff that i'm opening on like the first first like four minutes of the game it's hilarious <laughs> that's great was, yeah that was it was it was pretty funny i because i remember trying to mod like minecraft and stuff when we were playing Mm-hmm. And I was able to do it. Like even on my laptop, I wasn't able to do it. But then I, I don't know. I there was a high chance that like something was gonna go wrong when I cause I downloaded this thing on a flash drive from my old Dell laptop, and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna put the file in my Xbox. Yep. It just you know you take my account information and everything, just yeet yeah. it out the window. Yeah. I feel that. And, like, coming back to Minecraft, like, now, and knowing how to mod things, Mm -hmm. like, I, like, modded Minecraft is really fun. Um, And, like, I see the appeal to it from us as a kid. Do you play on your PC? On my little, my old Dell laptop? Yeah. Oh, I thought you had a PC set up. No, I I want a PC set up. I thought you got stuff to start setting something up, or was I wrong? No, I that was for my parents because we had that old that we had the super old computer that they just finally said get a new one, so I got a new one. Yeah. No, that thing is not like a gaming computer. That's just like an office computer, but with enough gaming capability for my little brother. Yeah. Um, so what I know we talked about it before about what your plans after college were but you were thinking um, I'm obviously not going to say like everything but Mm -hmm. uh, you were thinking about Indiana living in Indiana and working in Illinois for tax purposes for tax evasion for tax fraud yeah for tax fraud um, my main goal in life is to commit tax fraud every year and get away with in it. In different states. The IRS will never get a hold of me. Yeah. Um, I thought about it, but, you know, just the the pandemic, because the last, I think the last time we talked about this was like pre-pandemic. Oh, yeah, this was. This was years ago. We saw each other. We've seen each other post-pandemic. The last time yeah. we talked about this was pre-pandemic. Pre, yeah, we've seen each other since, but before yeah. that. Um, Cooking on all cylinders. Because, you know, like, Indiana is a cheaper state to live in mm-hmm. um, and all that. But, you know, now that I'm looking, like, beyond myself and that my future is not just myself anymore. Yeah. Also, I think I remember last time – Florida? Was that another thing that got brought up? <laughs> I remember something with Yeah, the, the grandparents house thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so when my girlfriend's grandparents die, they have willed the house to her. Lookout. Yeah. Um and so we would have this 
multi-million dollar house in Florida. Yeah. Um, that we would then be able to live in, but. Or probably um, sell though, right? He's, I, that's what I would like to do. Oh, is that in question now? That's what I would like to do. Um, I don't know. Cause like, I would like to sell it, but at the same time, there's value in Airbnb being it. Um, yes. But not as much value as you get millions, as millions right and then the getting smaller things to Airbnb. And yeah, buying a house. exactly. Or just buying an apartment complex. Yes. And then rent, and then just being a rent. That's and one thing. Going. That's one thing I wanted. I want to do is like end up like either building or buying a like a couple complexes in like the Big Ten um neighborhoods you know like all those colleges like having a couple of those and then i think like that that side income of like just getting someone to be like a landlord or just like a a, to watch you know like hiring one person hey just you know 20 hours a week i'll pay you this much per week whatever just go check in yeah i mean i like like it's it's I, landlord has its ups and downs, right? I, I am obviously not a landlord. I have never studied the thing about real estate in my life. Um, I just, you know, like, I think being a landlord is oddly active and involved when you have, like, maintenance issues or you have people. And, you know, that's when, like, maintenance teams come in and you're like, hey, I put a request in. Can you fix this? And you pay that guy or you just do it yourself. Um I don't know a lot about that specifically. My current like leasing agency has been really good to me. Um, yeah, so are, not to cut you off, but I did cut you off. You know, uh, I was just going to start rambling. So are you going back home then? Is that that's what I got from your father out of the past Zoom call that we did. So when I get into student teaching, I wrote in my application that I would be living back at home for that semester. It's so that they, so the way that the placement works um, is that you put down where you expect to live for the semester. You put down a couple of places that you would like to work. Um, and the ideal situation that they claim is that you will student teach within an hour of where you're you say you're going to live um so in my case i put that i will be living back at my parents house for that semester um so that they will place me within an hour of that okay so an hour of that though could be even that could even be in indiana because an hour away from your house is it'll be it'll be in Illinois because licensure issues because I'm licensed to teach in the state of Illinois. If I wanted to teach in Indiana, I'd have to go take the test over there. Gotcha. Um, and it's the same with like most states where you have to take the test, like their individual test. So, so every, so let's say you have, like, this is going to be re- reiterating what you just say, but, um, you leave Illinois, you have to go take, is it another course or just a test? That's to just teach? a test. And is the test the same in each state or is there different curriculums that you would have to adjust to? There, well, cause there's, education is really weird like that. The test is just a licensure test, which is, in, at least in Illinois, it was just a multiple choice, like display the skills that you will be teaching to students. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as advanced knowledge of the topic, which I passed. Um, And if I want to go do that in another state, I have to take their test. It will more than likely be short answer, or not short answer, it'll be multiple choice. Um, What was the other part of that question? The other part of that question was, would you have to take a test based on a new curriculum for a different state like do each does each state have its own curriculum that or does it go by school or so so that's that's a good question um there are national standards that's the common core 
Um, that's something that has kind of become a buzzword as of recent, um, which is just national standards um, guiding math, science, English language arts policy. Mm -hmm. um, and states can choose to directly adapt those policies um, or to use those policies to guide their own standards. Mm -hmm. um, and districts can go even further with that as long as they follow the national standards. Um, the national standards are benchmarks for the entire country, but states can like modify their own standards so, around that. So no matter what, you have to hit the Common Core, but you can go stricter than Common Core? It, it depends on where you are. It really does depend on where you are, because some, some states will be like, oh, so you're writing, so like you're doing uh, Common Core writing standard for 9 through 10 1, which is argumentative writing. Um, but we want you to do this specific type of argumentative writing um, in this specific way. And so that could realistically be a standard in some states. In Illinois, they just directly adapt the national standards. Um, so there's no additional yeah, so specifics. What Sorry to cut you off again, but what I meant by what I said before is that you can't not you cannot do less than what is Common Core. You have to at least meet Common Core, and you can add on to Common Core. Yeah, the so the standards are the benchmark of which we are expected to work with. Um, depending on your opinion on Common Core as a teacher, you can work within and around those standards. Um, yeah, because I, I have an aunt on my dad's side who is also, a, she's a sixth grade teacher, so she teaches all the subjects. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously I attend school and I've attended, uh, you know, schools where Common Core is a thing, mm -hmm. but every teacher and the and the basic consensus online is from like what social media and I, what I see is that Common Core is almost like frowned upon. Like it's not wanted because it's not specific to um, children. Yeah, a oh. lot of, I, I, I fall in that. I'm not a big fan of Common Core personally. I think that there is intentionally a lot of room for interpretation so that teachers have teachers and districts have some agency in coming up with curriculum so a lot of it's open-ended yeah but at some points also it's just like it's literally just this ta-da and there's like it's almost like there's nothing there it's just like you are expected to know how to do this and then there's no guidance on how they expect us to get to that benchmark and i guess that's where you know like methods courses and state standards and district curricula come into play and um, another point of contention for some people is how those standards are reflected in standardized testing yeah so that's what I was just about to ask you is so those common cores that's how they see if you reach those benchmarks is in standardized testing yeah standardized testing is basically just seeing where you are in relation to the standards uh, your expectations within your state within your country um, and again, that's another very unpopular thing, standardized testing. Mm -hmm. the, the, there is an agreement that there needs to be some form of benchmark, um, some sort of common assessment, but at the same time, um, a lot of people are saying that this isn't the right way to do it. Um, well, yeah, because yeah, I see a lot of times that there's often this picture when it comes to like teaching and stuff or when it comes to like being in the classroom where you it's the fish next to a tree and the monkey next to the tree and you tell them both to climb the tree yeah and the fish will live the rest of his life thinking he's stupid yeah that's i know that i know the image you're talking about yeah um yes there's merit to that um a lot of what we've been talking about in my methods courses are what is called socially just English language arts education, um, which is finding ways for every student to work to their strengths and also to scaffold up their weaknesses um, in order to learn at their most effective capacity. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of standardized tests, 
um, with like the fish in the tree and whatnot. Um, it's always like I, I don't know. Uh, like I, I understand you know, it. I, I, I agree. With, I, I understand the image, um, and I'm not like a fan of. I'm not a big fan of Common Core or the rate at which we standardize tests. Well, the thing is, is it's now since like we're talking about it more in depth, is that doesn't it kind of seem, you know, like very socialist in a way like not to use that term while like, commies. yeah like not to use that term <laughs> so freely but like the same people that are like freedom and you know want to do it their way is almost are, the, are a lot of the same people that lobby i would think for you know like standardized testing because I feel like a lot of those you teach a kid how like what you want them to be right so if you are telling like every kid obviously isn't suit in the same suited in the same way as where they have like this like some people are good at math some people are good at English some people are really good at science or social studies something like that but like common core all you make them all do the same things the same way and then you give them that test and then you know obviously some aren't going to do as good as the others in certain areas mm -hmm. but wouldn't you want a more diverse schooling or education to where people are coming out of high school knowing almost like almost guided and but not guided in the way that we are now to where like you do something because it makes more money or you do something because like a lot of people you know they'll go to school because something makes more money or they'll go to a like they'll do a union job because that's how because they weren't they'll do a union job because they weren't good at a certain school subject so they were like oh no I can't go to school. I can't go to college because I wasn't good at blank. Mm -hmm. So they just end up, you know, doing what whatever you do, you know. Yeah. Um, the so the standards and the standardized testing are, as I've mentioned before, they're baseline. Mm -hmm. um, the goal of standardized testing is to show a, a understanding of those topics. Um, and it is the hope and the desire. This is my understanding of everything um, as a college education at work um, is that students, when they find their interest, will further their own learning. Um, and that is achieved when educators provide their students with an interesting curriculum that unlocks their potential and what, unlocks what they want to do. Um, standardized tests are really just to show how we're doing in relation to getting to those baseline standards, those standards that we think that each student in America should be able to do. And as students find out what they're interested in and pursue things that they want to do, that they go beyond those standards um, to develop like career specific um, skill banks or whatnot, what have you, if that makes sense. Um, so your job is to introduce them to something and then them to find interest in it yes i would say that the job of an educator is to introduce their students to a wide variety of topics within the scope of a subject so like english uh science math um and to provide them with a basic set of understandings for that, so like for, because I'm an English major, I can talk about that easily enough. So talking about like different forms of writing, um, different forms of communicating, different, lang different linguistic types when you're talking about standard American English versus African American vernacular English. 
Um, and because I'm an English major, these are things that I'm interested in. And so these are things that I've talked with teachers about and further developed my interest in. These are not like mentioned explicitly in the standards, um, which is a big reason why I don't agree with them is because they are very rooted in traditional educational values, um, values that were created and haven't really changed since the turn of the 20th century. Um, so I would say, yes, my job as a teacher is to introduce students to a wide variety of topics within the scope of my field. And if they find something that interests them, um, that I can allocate resources and provide them further knowledge on things that they're interested in so that they can develop increased literacies in that topic while also catering to the needs of the standards and ensuring that every student has a baseline understanding of what is expected of them at the national level. I think that was very well put. Um, yeah. um, Grandpa, if you're listening to this, I do know how to speak. You do be speaking. I do be speaking English. <laughs> well, that's another thing that I want to ask you is that, so now you brought up your interests why why did you choose to be an english major yeah uh, i just and i i don't need something like spectacular i just i was i'm just Ever since i was, I was a little boy <laughs> yeah i'm just genuinely curious because you talked about history and i think history is more uh, personally i think history teacher or like being a history teacher or teaching history or learning about history is m more interesting to mm -hmm. me just because I, I mean, history, you can, there's not, I feel like there's nothing where you don't, you don't stop learn. Like you can always learn more about history. Yeah. But yeah, I feel when like, there's so many ways I'm, and this is, could be very naive of me to say that there's only so many ways to read or write or think about a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, that's a very enclosed space. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at me like I'm stupid, but like, this so is... no, so I'll, I'll, I'll cut you off. Okay. Um, so that is something that we talk about a lot in my methods courses personally is the way that teachers have taught and wrote about literature um, is that it's either the teacher's way or the highway. Um, and you, you've, de you've experienced this before where it's like, you know, you have your own interpretation um, and the teacher's like, yeah, but let's think about it in yeah. my way, the way that I understand it, especially as you become more seasoned as a teacher, you're like, well, these are the things that I know. These are the things that I've discussed over years and years and years. So these are the things that I'm going to stick with. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of ways to read a book, or read a text. There are a lot of ways to write about a text. Um, and I think that students inherently want to read and write. Um, the reading and writing is something that everyone is interested in. It's just the way that it is taught and the way that it is executed in schools that turns a lot of people off. Because I know when I was a kid, like I used to love reading and you can, you can like confirm that I used to be a big reader when I was in elementary school and then when middle school came around oh, and I had right. to start reading for class and as it got worse in high school um my love of reading died off and now that I'm back in college um and like reading independently again like it's so nice to read things that I want to read instead of reading things that I'm forced to read you know like when you're forced yeah. to do something and you don't want to do it yeah that's I think because I was never, a, I'm still not a great student. I'm a very much, a, why, like, why do I have to, like, in math, why do I have to show my work? There's, a, there's no such thing as a bad student, yes. right? There's, there are different types of students, and it's another job of the teacher to reach out to all those students and to provide them with tools, resources, and methods to yeah, well, I can, I, there's some times where I should have been, like, there's times where I definitely could have been more accountable on myself and just, you know, done some, a lot of it's, I don't want to do it, so I don't do it, or I didn't do it, 
Whereas now, uh, like, I know I have to do something and it's, it's more up for stakes, you know, because this is, like I said, I'm, you know, going into construction management. A lot of my courses are career-based, real world. This is what's going to come up and how are you going to deal with it? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, it's more of like responsibility based. Like I, I'm going to have to take responsibility out in the field. So I need to start taking responsibility now. But um, whereas it, like, you know, in elementary school, like fifth grade, I would go into my class and it's like, here's your packet for the month. I, every day you come into class, here's the writing prompt, write. And it's like, I, I don't, I don't want to. So I'm not, because I don't want to write about whatever you want me to write about. Exactly. It's not, it's not student centered. It's teen, it's, the teacher wants what the teacher wants Mm -hmm. and I as a student don't want to do that yeah and that's like I feel because I was very opposite of like children a lot of children away because I my I think it was because we like we grew up playing video games and stuff or like my imagination couldn't really go outside of a text like if I'm reading something, my imagination couldn't put me in a place or into that into the perspective of whatever I was reading. So I really, really as a kid, I only liked nonfiction because it was what it's already happened. There's there's either a picture of it or a a vivid very or a very descriptive narrative of what happened, who it happened to, how it happened. And when it happened, Mm -hmm. and I can go ask somebody if it's like American history or something, I can go ask somebody and they'll be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this happened. This is what was going on when I was, you know, like everybody had like a, and at least in those, in that context, I have somebody like, oh, blah, 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 blah. That's like, that happened. This is what was going on. Mm -hmm. Whereas like I pick up a, a non or a fiction book and I have to create what I think the character looks like. I mean, there are some descriptive fiction books, obviously, but yeah. not, when you're that young, they're not really yeah. super descriptive. It's very, what can you put your own mind up to? And I just wasn't, and I, I was like one of those kids who would like skim the page so I'd miss lines and things wouldn't connect. Whereas if I was reading a fiction, I was like, boom, 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 boom. It was like almost like reading bullet points instead of reading paragraphs you know like yeah 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 and I, that that has a lot to do with like obviously personal interest that has a lot to do with how you were taught to read as a kid and mm-hmm. what you were taught to read as a kid mm-hmm. um, can I ask you a question were you so I was I was in I think I had I was behind in reading comprehension pretty much my entire this up until sophomore year of high school I was considered to be behind in reading in every class, in all my English classes. So I was taught, I would they would take me into a special room and I would have to like, it was like I skipped a period that everybody else had or something. Like their English class was my reading comprehension class and they would take me and a couple other kids. And I forgot what the program was called, but they would put me on a computer and I would have to read something and then I pick it out and there's multiple choice. And it was like basically taking a quiz every, every class I took a quiz, but I was taught to read the questions and then go back and read the passage. Yes. To find the answer to my question. Yes. Have, were you that ever is. taught that or is that something that you picked up? I, in studying for this, in studying for the ACT, which I took, um, I was told that it's better to read the questions first to know what you're looking for in the text. Yeah, that's um, I. I took the SAT, and that was what the, another thing that they said as well. I was that's what I was taught. I didn't pick that up. Um, so, well, yeah. I just I think that's a part of where that whole I'm not reading for comp I'm not reading for the picture I'm reading to get the answer uh, yeah I'm reading for knowledge I'm not reading for pleasure yeah um, and I feel I was taught that but I was taught that in 
the early stages of me just trying to read. Yeah. So no, everything, I was just taught to read. Yeah, everything I read from that point on was, if it was for school, it was to get, I, I read the worksheet or I read the, like I would le- read, uh, I would search up online like the Spark Notes or whatever for the pa- the uh, that chapter, mm-hmm. and I would just read those because those were more common questions to be brought up by the teacher of like what happened in this chapter. Yes, exactly. I I as a teacher, as a teacher person, I really like Spark Notes. I think that Spark Notes is a really valuable and accessible tool. Um, that even if like you're not reading the text you're you're still absorbing the contents of the text and you can still talk about like larger themes and about larger happenings in the book Mm -hmm. and you're getting all the important information Mm -hmm. um the spark notes and like other online resources i think are really valuable like that because it saves time students are right now like super pressed for time because they're expected to do all this stuff Mm -hmm. for school and for social lives um and a lot of them just don't have time to read for class and so i think you should pedagogically you should assign texts to read Mm -hmm. but you should also not be like that teacher that picks out really specific details to quiz them so with that being said would you say it's more important to understand the theme of the book than understand characters or viewpoints yes absolutely i the only book full disclosure one of the only books i ever actually read in high school was gatsby i could not tell you what happens in gatsby i could not tell you anything besides jay gatsby really just wants like daisy yeah i can't even remember her last name daisy was the person but I i remember that because we had to read that too but i only remember watching the movie I we didn't even get to watch the movie Uh um but so like I can't remember what happened right but I can tell you about the American dream and the ideals of America at the 1920s when the book was written Mm -hmm. um books have that kind of state books aren't necessarily important for the content they're important for what they're about what they talk about Mm -hmm. um so like I don't want you to come away from a book knowing the names of all the characters i want you to come away from a book knowing what it's about you know like Like each book has its own beyond the book would you say that every book has a bigger picture beyond the book then yes each book because each book has to come from some form of inspiration um books don't just happen in a vacuum they happen as a result of what's going on in the world Mm -hmm um so under like getting the themes of a book i think are super important and i think that each book has a story to tell and a message to give so with you being a future teacher of the next generation how do you think because i had a rough time focusing on books and stuff when i was growing up and i didn't I mean, I grew up with a phone. I got my first phone at like, I got my first flip phone with minutes at 12. But then I got my first smartphone when I was like 14. Mm -hmm. So I know, what what grade are you going to? High school? High school. Ideally freshmen and sophomores. Yeah. So obviously I know, you know, nine-year-olds with phones. Mm -hmm. So how do you think do you think it's a misconception that having technology distracts you no and no you you fully agree with i you. think that technology is a very valuable tool that educators have just been slow to utilize in their classrooms um texting has its own like unique language and um, one, of the, one of the things not to cut and i keep cutting off but no, not so, but it. one of the things i you know i was just like bored sitting in bed but one of the things i thought of is that emojis now are like hieroglyphics if you think about it 
Mm -hmm. There's pictures with meanings that we all know. Exactly. You know, and, and there's there's stories to tell with those. You can tell whole stories in emoji. Yeah. So, um, yeah, keep on, keep on. I think that in terms of reading, while there should be traditional like books, mm -hmm. um, and not traditional books as in like the literary canon, traditional books is like actually opening a book. Um, that we should include like Facebook, like how to read social media, how to read like pop up news stories, how to read like text because text is like this constantly evolving and socially constructed language that's really interesting. Like how to read text as in text messages as in like how to receive them and perceive them like how like emotions from someone else or how to send one with emotion to convey like if that was to be a curriculum right let's say that's you make that a curriculum yeah what would you want to put in your curriculum for how to read perceive and send text messages with emotion like the like the three thing logos pathos ethos how do you how do you go about that well the first thing you gotta do is you gotta look at the standards yeah i know i know um and there are different types of standards as well uh, i didn't mention this earlier there's the common core state standards which are mandatory um and then there are what are now it's the advocating for justice uh state social justice standards uh it used to be teaching tolerance it just changed like a month ago and yeah i, I, I don't think name. i ever i've heard of teaching tolerance before i've never heard of they social. just they just changed their name um which are like advocacy standards for students um the teachers are highly recommended to look at and use in their their writing so you look at the standards that you want to use uh, and then what I will do is I'll come up with my, it's called a SPAT, a Summative Performance Assessment Task. Mm -hmm. So I'll basically come up with my final for that unit. Uh, so you first. work backwards. I work backwards. Theoretically. Okay. Theoretically, I go from end to start because I think it's easier to construct when you know what you're constructing towards. Yeah, definitely. You can't, you can't um, just start building a building without a plan. Exactly. Um, so in the in the in the context of this this curriculum that you've thrown at me, it sounds like you want me to talk about the rhetorical effects of text messaging. Well, yeah. So we so when when you say if 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 you work when I think of putting a text message or having that or even social media when you read because it's a person and either you know that person very well or you don't mm -hmm. and same thing with like an email or whatever if you sent me a text saying blah 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 but i know you and i like like you could say something you could probably say something pretty mean to me but i know you and i know how it's gonna how it sounds when you say it mm -hmm. but let's say i'm taking it to somebody i don't know that well like yeah like what how like it's uh, it's also if you think about it it's more so it's relationships how long have you known a person it's it's a lot to unpack there like mm -hmm. and that's there's a lot there to do with social skills alongside more traditional schooling topics would you like, say social skills is a part of english me i would feel i feel like being an english teacher is teaching social skills too social skills should be a part of every curriculum uh each subject i would think um each skill has its own different set of unique social skills like math the big thing about math is problem solving right so in math you do a lot of problem solving in groups or whatnot english i think one of the best things about english is that it's one of the most interpretive and free subjects mm -hmm. um so there's a lot that I can do with the English curriculum. Well, um, like that's the, like a lot of people in college, they're, they like, 
even in high school, they made rules. I don't know if it's a part of that thing you said, the te- the social justice, whatever. Um, I don't mean to really make a mockery of what you said, but I just didn't remember the words. Um, but people would go up and like for like a group project or they would have to give a presentation and teachers would be like, I know some of you don't like to speak in front of crowds or I know some of you get social anxiety or something like that. And I don't know if that is a good or a bad thing because at a young age, I feel when you're younger like that, like high school, I'd rather break out of my not being able to talk in front of a crowd or in front of a couple people in high school than having to give like, let's say I work, I'm like a working my way up in a company or something. And now it's like, I'm, I'm doing a presentation on why this job or why we should do this job or why it should be done this way. And this is the first time anybody's come, hey, you have to talk in front of these people at a job level. And you've never, nobody's ever forced you before in school to go out of that comfort zone. And I don't know if that's personally a good thing or not, because yes, it's good to make your students feel comfortable and, you know, have them feel like safe in your classroom and all that. But also, wouldn't you rather get experience doing that in a classroom where it's not everybody's almost everybody's in the same stage of like nobody's perfect and nobody's been doing this forever you know yeah i that's one of the like few nice things about district mandated curriculum is that it's usually organized in a way where in your four years there is a a gradual scaffold and removal of scaffolding for those kinds of skills um and again, this goes like, so like in freshman year, like the expectation is like that you can effectively like research a topic and present about it. Whereas in your senior year of high school, it might be more about how you deliver that speech um, because you've already developed the skills of collecting research and giving a presentation. Whereas now it's about how you deliver that presentation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so and, and as, as far as, you know, like making sure that everyone is comfortable with what they're doing, um, as far as I understand as a teacher student, as an educator student, um, that student comfort is important, but at the same time, this goes back to that discussion of standards where, you know, students have to have this baseline understanding of how to do something. They may never ever have to give a presentation about anything in their class or in their profession right like they might do they might end up doing like cosmetology and they won't ever have to give a presentation about how to cut hair um but it's important that they understand how to speak because and i think this even goes back to that social skills thing right because they have this thing that they're talking about and that they can clearly civilly and ethically deliver that information to someone else in a way that is professional and indicative of the audience that they are interacting with. So like in that case being like a classroom, but in other instances, like say we were doing a debate or like a formal debate where we're talking about information um, and understanding the difference in audience in that moment. And that transfers into social media Um, where it's not speaking but writing but in the same sense of a focus on audience and what kind of language you can use Mm -hmm. there you go i love talking about education in english i think it's really interesting well i just think there's like there's so many new forms of speaking you know of communication absolutely And that's where, you know, just like just the book, the book thing was never my, you know, my strong suit or whatever, Mm -hmm. but I could write a paper. Um, And I mean, you know how to read though, right? Yeah. Like you have an understanding of how to read. So you, you worked within the standards. I didn't mean to make that sound insulting. You do know know how to read, right? Yeah. You're seven. You know how to read. (laughs) I'm seven and I know how to read. Um, Yeah. 
you, but like school gave you those opportunities to develop those skills. Yeah. Um, and while you might not use them doing construction, um, you still have those skills that you can transfer to like social media or other real world scenarios. Yeah. Cause even, even now, like when I go back to Chicago and I work with MPL, it's not even, it's more so text messages as understanding tone and understanding how prompt to be and when to talk and when not to respond, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, those are skills that, you know, we can work on in school. It's hard to do. But you think, really. isn't it weird, though, that that learning how to text and learning how to read text messages could be a curriculum? And it's not, you know, that not it's not that far-fetched. Like, it actually could be useful. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's honestly a really good skill to know is the the formality and conventions of text messaging. Mm -hmm. um, I I know in my writing class that we're doing right now, we talk a lot about formal writing assignments in the field work that we're doing. Um, the final assessment that we've given our class of students is a formal letter to the principal about a school policy that they want to change or add. Um, and that's like formal letter writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean to call out my friend here if she ends up listening to this, but when we were, when she was talking about the relevance of her lesson in drafting, she said, and you might use this one day or something basically. Um, and this is about formal letter writing. And I don't know how many formal letters you've written in the last two years. Um, but I'm going to guess that number's in the single digits, quite frankly. Yeah. No one's writing letters the way that we used to. Um, yeah. But texts are a very valuable, very prevalent form of communicating. So I think that a text-based yeah. curriculum is important. I feel like it goes on like in like importance level of getting things across. Like if it's something legal, you send like a, a letter. Like if it's like a legal like, hey, we need to meet at court, you send like a piece of paper mm -hmm. typed or something. But then yeah. it goes like that, email, text message, social media, DM. Like yeah, the levels yeah. of like how important, how prompt something is, if like, or how professional something is, you know, mm -hmm. I would go like court order, like legal stuff, like, like actually paper letter, then like, like job offer, job, like resume, email, then someone, you know, or close to or someone you're trying to get in contact with Talks yeah me. yeah and I mean like those are the types of like those are the things that you should be learning in an English classroom is when to use different forms of writing you know mm -hmm. and how to effectively communicate within those systems yeah um, so I mean yeah it is we it's weird to think about how we grew up and how like stuff like that how how we get in trouble for like being on our phones in class and you know all that stuff and social media and stuff and it's now like that could that could actually be a, a curriculum that's beneficial um and then you added me on linkedin did you just make your linkedin or have you had a linkedin I have had a LinkedIn for three and a half years now. Okay, so you've I so I just uh, as in like the past I think I I had to make it for freshman year. I had to set one up. I I just made one recently, um, and it's just like also knowing different types of social media, you know, just like where to use what and how to use it. It's just it's weird to think of 
as of those platforms as such a different thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's honestly really interesting to like think about. How, so would you be more of a free thought English teacher? How do you mean? So as we've been talking, you've talked about the more veteran of a teacher, the more stuck to how they look at books and how they look at assignments they've given. So I'm asking as, let's say you're at your tenure, Mm -hmm. are you going to be the same open-minded guy that you are right now? looking for your student teacher internship? I would like to say yes. I think that from all the methods courses that I have taken and all the learning that I have done, that I want to be that teacher that allows students to have their interpretations. And if they're backed up by legitimate source and analysis, then that is a fair and legitimate thought that they have had. Um, I say that now before I have entered student teaching. Um, I'm dedicated, I'm dedicated to that work right now, but as I go into the field and as I develop real experience running and operating a classroom, I have no idea how that will maintain or how I will adapt for that. You know, I just, we've done all this learning, Mm -hmm. but all this learning has happened in a vacuum where we do like 15 hours of field work. We're out in an actual classroom, like watching the teacher work and then having like a lesson to actually teach. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Excuse me. Um, And I think that that's a big issue with, the way that we teach teachers is that a lot of it's just like, and you will do, you might do this in your classroom. We would like you to do this in your classroom, but we won't give you ample opportunity to fine tune your craft before we send you out into the world. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would like to say yes, that I will be a free thought teacher. Um, Do you have a, do you have a, do you have a moment in a, like a, in a classroom that you're like, I want to be a teacher, like this is what I want to do, or do you have a favorite, te- like a teacher-student moment between you and a teacher that was like, this person's significantly changed my life, and you don't have to go into super detail about what it was about or what it was if you don't want to, but it's because a lot of people, I I would have to say you there has to be like a nobody's I don't think ever anybody's ever run like I want to be te- like there no everybody wants to like when they're like kids and stuff they want to be an astronaut firefighter police officer veterinarian you know all that stuff is there a moment where that you can recall where you go oh I know I want to I want to do this I wouldn't say there was a specific moment per se um In high school, but in high school, I had four absolute, four, five technically, but four absolutely amazing English teachers who you could tell really enjoyed what they did, Mm -hmm. um, were passionate about what they did, and I learned a lot in those classes. Um, They really inspired me to you know to share that passion with them to share my passion and because they were so passionate it became my thing um and ever since i've been in college i haven't regretted the decision to be an english major and to to constantly listen to oh what are you going to do with that degree or oh a teacher really yeah because i I mean even i'll tell like i'll tell my aunt who's on my dad's side that you want to be a teacher and he, she she goes why why like she i mean she loves being a teacher and she loves her kids but it, it, like you see the market you see how they treat teachers you see all this stuff in the news about 
teacher unions going on strike and no, obviously I, I completely, after, especially after everything that's gone on this past year, that teachers don't get paid enough. And then you see all these parents that can't even handle their own children when it comes to teaching them. And obviously it's like, okay, you see all this stuff, now change it. And nothing's really happening, you know? Yeah, so, and nothing is going to happen. Optimistically, I would like a lot of things to change. But realistically, change is a very slow-moving beast. And the state of education will be different when I retire um, than it will be when I get in there next semester. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's going to be some rapid, like I come back one year and it's a completely different deal, you know. I think it's just we need better teacher education programs. Um to better equip teachers for the realities of teaching mm -hmm. um, and providing them with tools and resources and methods to effectively change the system that we currently teach in. If that makes sense. I mean, that was a lot of big stuff to unpack there, but what I got from what you just said is that, that you need more preparation and you need more, more time or more Maybe, maybe reword that for someone like me who doesn't use big words. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think, yes, I think that change, I, I'll, I'll just restart the statement. Change is slow. Um, change is slow and change is not always forward moving and upward moving. I think in terms of change in education that we need teachers to, uh, we need teacher education programs to provide future teachers with the realities of teaching, what teaching will really look like. Uh, we need to provide more real experiences in a classroom to develop who we are before they send us into our own classroom to figure it out without any, without any like net to catch us. Um, and I think that educate teacher education programs need to um, give us insight, give us more tools and resources to change what already exists from the inside rather than just waiting for the change to come otherwise. Yeah, I, 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 after you explain, I definitely understand what you now said before better after that. Just, uh, cause I know, like, like I was saying, like, you say I'm going to be a teacher and there's like a, almost like, a, like before people be like, before all this like bad pay and all this stuff in the news and like more stuff got exposed on social media is all like, oh, good for you. You're such a good person for being a teacher, this and that. And now it's now it's almost like, why would you put yourself through that, all that? And I mean, I've, I mean, I've known, but I knew you wanted to be a teacher before we knew about like pay and stuff it was like, you yeah. Know, right? So I know, like, I know that this isn't, that wasn't really something that you were going to change your mind on and you know that's one of the things that I realized being in college too like the more you take like the college courses of like real world stuff um and then like more of getting into your craft and more specific things if you don't like those classes then you're probably not going to be really into your major but since you say you're really into them you know like that's going to be that's just another telltale factor of like you actually want to do this mm -hmm. And yeah, I, like I said earlier, there is not a moment of my formal education that I have regretted being an English education major. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing and listening to what other teachers are saying and seeing what the forums are saying, how people are realizing what teaching actually is and what is being asked of teachers. Um, that this is something that I really want to do and that I am excited to excited 
but terrified to get into at the same time because you know like I've been swimming in this lake of college teacher education preparation for four years and eventually one day I'm just going to get picked up and thrown into the Pacific of the real real world and I'm terrified for the future because I just don't know what's going to happen I don't know what's going to happen with education well yeah you can say I mean I guess it's a little bit more wavering with education but you can say you know nobody knows the future I mean my degree is very much based off of hey do you guys want to build something no okay I guess I'll go sit in my office and wait till you guys want to build something mm -hmm. and yeah. you know uh, uh, there's uh, you know there's this everybody everybody's going to want something built everybody, everybody's going to want something tearing down or taken down you know so like I guess I have that but I feel like, you know, I, within your first 10 years, I know you said like change won't be super fast or whatever, but within your 10 year, I feel like change, or like te teaching will become more of like a guidance of youth instead of, hey, here is what you need to learn today. Because realistically, they have this thing in their pocket that you know can tell them or show them anything they want mm. whereas you know we both had obviously teachers where it's like okay yeah you can go read this in a book you can go see this on the internet but you're not going to get that you know real world real talk experience with a, another human being that's going to show you a perspective like that you know it's yeah so it's i know in my history courses as well as my English courses it's less about the memorization of facts like it's not important to remember the day that World War I started or um, what Hamlet did to anyone else in Hamlet um, it's about the skills that surround that analysis and understanding of the topic more than it is rote recitation of facts to be tested upon on a multiple choice exam. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy that that's the direction we're going in, to be yeah. sure. Um, that's the type of education that I wish I had. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, feel like, I feel like the teachers right before us are, are just like right in between like that that seesaw like right in the middle of like hey i wanna i wanna be more individual and i wanna more i wanna help you and as a as a student as just you as a student rather than get make sure the class does well or at least shows that they do well and a lot of a lot of teachers at least in high, high school for me were just like how are you how are you doing with this instead of hey, you're falling behind in class, you know? A lot of before, like up until freshman year of high school, it was a, hey, hey, you're not where the other students were at, not a, hey, you're, like, how are you doing with this? Instead of, like, they, they brought it to me as a, the class is here and you're here, instead of, hey, you're here, but how do we get you to there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. I mean, yeah, I think that that's that shift in tone from you are here, you must be here to you are here. How can we work together to get you to here, mm -hmm. you know? Instead of making it a, just like an isolation. Yeah. Ask. Yeah. All right. I need to get going here in a minute. Yeah. So and it's almost wrap things up. Yeah, it's about it's almost midnight for me. Um thanks again for staying on for this random uh this sudden random, and you know exclusive podcast. Ex exclusive podcast. Uh this is the first episode of Talk King. Talk Kings. So I think we're just gonna I just wanna say thanks again, Tom, for being yeah. here. And thanks for ends. deciding to start recording <laughs> yeah i just you know sometimes you gotta hit record and go are, with it. 
it was a good conversation. Yeah, I I definitely came out of this with a lot of, you know, a lot of different thoughts on, you know, teaching and I'm excited to where where you think it's going to go and you definitely brought up stuff that I've never thought about especially in that space. So I'm uh, I'm excited to see where you take things and you know, we're definitely going to I'm probably going to text you either tomorrow or 10 minutes from now. I'm going to do this again a lot more, okay? That sounds good. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right.